my name's Sean Clarkson. I'm joined by a fantastic panel uh, for this session. In the interest of time, I'm going to let them introduce themselves uh, as part of their sessions. My role is to facilitate the panel, but also just do a little bit of scene setting. Um, as the title suggests, we're going to be talking about uh, tackling health inequalities, talking about some of the work of the HSNs, what we're doing across the country to tackle inequalities, and really bring it to life by some of the examples that my fellow panel members are going to give. So just to set the scene, I just want to talk about health inequalities. I'm sure it's something that everybody in the, the theatre this afternoon was very aware of and has kind of been following for the last few years, particularly throughout the course of the pandemic. Health inequalities, nothing new. They've been around for a long time. Stubborn challenges, stubborn inequalities ac across all different parts of the country. So Michael Marmot uh, published a paper, Fair Society, Healthier Lives, prior to the pandemic and really brought to life with some quite hard hitting figures as you can see on the slide there, some of the challenges we face around inequalities. The pandemic only sought to exacerbate some of those challenges, but also really highlighted them, both highlighted the impact of health inequalities through some of the disproportionate impacts we saw throughout the pandemic, but also really highlighted the prevalence across the country and particularly in different areas. Um, I mentioned some of the, the numbers just kind of bringing the, um, the challenge to life. Here are some of the numbers from across England, and you can see the stark impact that health inequalities has on people's lives, people's uh, life outcomes, and their kind of general enjoyment and well-being throughout life. I mentioned the impact of the pandemic, and mentioned that the pandemic's only exacerbated these existing challenges. Again, you can see some of the numbers on there. You can see how the numbers have got far worse throughout the pandemic and only made that situation worse. And I just want to talk about health inequalities a little bit wider, talk about some of the fundamental underlying concepts that, again, I'm sure many of you kind of work across the system very familiar with. The first one I wanted to touch on is the fact that tackling health inequalities is not just about health. It's not just a health and well-being challenge. It's not just a challenge for the health and care system. It's a challenge for everybody. Uh, we need to start thinking about both health combined with the wealth axes. So by wealth, I'm talking about the economy the links between people being in employment, being in good employment, and the impact that has on their life outcomes. That also links into the wider determinants of health, so housing, transport, uh, people being able to engage in well-being activities, sports activities, and so on. All of those all combine to support somebody and support their life outcomes, support their health and well-being. Um, if we start to introduce interventions that tackle things like transport, for example, that's a fantastic example of how we can start to tackle inequalities. And we'll see that come out in some of the presentations later on. The other concept I wanted to talk about that I've just briefly touched on is the fact that tackling health inequalities is the job for everybody. It's a massive challenge. We need everybody across the system to come together and work together. Integrated care systems, hospital trusts, primary care networks, mayoral combined authorities, local enterprise partnerships. It's everybody's role, it's everybody's job to work together. It's a challenge that we just cannot do as one single organisation. Um, and I just wanted to reference the fact that the time to tackle health inequalities was yesterday, was a year ago, it's now. The pandemic's only kind of made that worse and that's really played out here. Health inequalities are rising, we've got life expectancy reducing and we've also got people who are struggling to access health and care uh, services across the country. One of the ways we can start to address those challenges is through innovation. And the examples that the fellow panel members are going to give really brings to life some of those innovations we're supporting across the HSN network and how we're implementing them across systems to start to tackle this challenge. And I'll just conclude by uh, referencing some of the work that we're doing in the HSN network that, again, uh, the panel will kind of bring to life. We work really closely with integrated care systems to tackle some of the challenges at place level. We work with fantastic innovators like Galib and, and other people who are developing solutions that we can implement across the country to start to tackle these challenges. So that's it for me, a very quick kind of whistle-stop uh, intro to health inequalities. I hope that sets the scene, sets the context for the rest of the panel. So really pleased to hand over now to uh, Dr. Linos Jones, who's going to talk about the work that she's been doing. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sean. Um, so so I'm Flynnos, I'm working in Mid-Yorkshire, and I'm actually a, a respiratory consultant, but my special interest is asthma. So most of you will have heard of asthma, and in fact about 10% of the audience may well suffer from asthma, because it's not an uncommon disease. 
although common and often mild, for some people it's very severe and debilitating, and then sadly it's often preventable deaths happen because of, of asthma. Um, we're not very good in the UK at preventing preventable asthma deaths, um, and so that's bad news. But we have developed some transformative medicines that um, actually switch off uh, asthma. So we're talking finally about asthma patients going into remission, which is wonderful. It's estimated, however, that 80% of people who are eligible for these transformative uh, biologic injections for their asthma don't get to them. And of that 80%, there's a disproportionate amount of people from ethnic minorities not getting to injections. And I, I want to change that. It's wrong. We've known for some time, as Sean was saying, about health inequalities. And we also know that for asthma in particular, it's a condition that you need to self-manage. But self-management is desperately hard to do in certain populations, populations where there's low literacy. One in six of our patients are functionally literate. Did you know that? It's, it's a shocking, shocking thing. Um, and lots of people don't know about it. Um, people with low health engagements um, and people who have language and cultural barriers to getting to treatment are all disproportionately disadvantaged in terms of their asthma care and self-management. Now, my journey started um, as I was coming off maternity leave for my son, who's now six. Um, I was tasked uh, in, in Dewsbury to, to set up a difficult asthma clinic. I'd worked there for some time, and I knew that my patients weren't a sea of Caucasian middle-class patients. They are people from very, very socially deprived backgrounds um, and there's a lot of ethnic diversity in the area that I worked so I naively thought I'll just ring around and I'll try and get some resources in different languages and different formats for my patients and quickly realize they do not exist they do not exist for a condition that you need to self-manage now you tell a Welsh woman that you can't give information in any other language than English and you're going to get a reaction and that's exactly what happened so what did I do? And I, in hindsight, I think the first thing I did was get really distressed about this because I was unable to provide equitable care to my patients. And that's distressing, that's hard, I hate that. The next thing I was advised to do was to lobby pharmaceutical companies. I did that for years, blood, sweat and tears, trying to persuade colleagues in pharma to translate their information into different languages. And the no's kept pouring in, you're nodding, you know what it's like, it's really, really tough. And so I had to accept more distress at the lack of cooperation. I tell you, I was a brunette when I started this, this work. I've had to highlight my hair to cover the greys, accepting all this distress. But they shouldn't be allowed to say no, right? There shouldn't be a, a no for this. It's, it's pennies. It costs pennies to do this work, but they were simply not doing it. I have a choice, though, as a clinician. And so if companies won't buy into this inclusivity work that I'm doing, I no longer prescribe their products for my patients. If it's not available to all my patients, I don't give that medication out anymore. And I challenge everybody to have a little think about that. Um, I lost sleep over how to share information because sharing information on a national level is tough. It's, there's no easy, simple solution for this. I was very lucky that my colleagues at the British Thoracic Society, who I'd already worked for in some of the national projects, were kind enough to give me a, a hub on their Respiratory Features website to share this information. And I was a bit frustrated about how how long it was taking and how hard it was. So I went and got my own darn grant to help sort it out. I didn't do that on my own. I did it with help from the HSN and the wonderful human being that is Harriet Smith. She's a force of nature and a real, real um, asset to the project that I'm doing. I tell you, if we could clone Harriet, we wouldn't need conferences like this. We'd all just be sorted. Um, but what we're doing is aiming to increase the uptake of um, biologic treatments for asthma patients and also helping to recognize what poorly controlled asthma is because a lot of my patients don't know what asthma is and they don't recognize when it's poorly controlled and that causes lots of emergency admissions and all sorts of suffering and problems. Um, I'm currently running an evaluation with um, collaborators at the University of Huddersfield to look at what's currently available. It, they're, short, they're not long interviews because there's not a lot out there after all these years of blood, sweat and tears. Um, and then we're using that to guide our intervention and to make further resources, which pragmatically I think is going to look like videos with QR codes, graphic medicine sheets, which is a narrative entirely in pictures. And they're not infographics, it's all pictures, and I'll show you a bit in a minute. And I'm really dead excited about the community champions work that we're doing. Um, the community works lovely because it means I get to come out of silos. Um, I, d I, I don't work as an island and I've got to work with lots of different agencies, third sector, um, public health, primary care. It's been really, really, really exciting. Um, 
And we knew that this work worked well because a few years ago we did some breast and cervical cancer screening with champions. So I've wanted money to do this for a while. In the interim, we've had the small sort of matter of a global pandemic. So, um, you know, we've, we've learned lots of lessons from uh, COVID champions in Kirklees. Now, this is a quote from a colleague of mine who did part of that work, Helen Orlick. She says, when given resources, our communities can sort themselves out. There's a wisdom in communities. We need to trust them more. They can sort themselves out. We gave them a pot of money and they made some beautiful resources and managed that very, very well. I no longer believe that there are hard to reach populations. I think we're pants at reaching them. And again, that needs to change. Well, everything I'm doing is on a co-production model and what we're doing at the minute is retraining COVID champions as asthma champions and also using social prescribers to try and encourage people to come to clinics and all sorts of things. For each pound spent, Helen reckons we saved £3.70. That's huge. That's a huge amount of savings. Now, preventive medicine's never sexy. It's not very well invested in, but it can save lives and it can save money in the long run. I don't mind sharing with you, I have a patient who at 20 years old had, had two ITU admissions for asthma Nearly lost her life, first time she was pregnant, second time she had a baby girl. I costed out her at hospital admission costs. They were 70,000 pounds, 70,000 pounds, and nearly the death of a young mother, devastating. When I spoke to her on the phone during the pandemic, she didn't read and write, but she was British born, didn't speak English very well, or she preferred to speak, to speak another language at home, which I completely recognize, I, I'm the same. And um, she didn't read and write very well. So I took some time, explained her asthma to her, um, we intervened with a practice nurse as well, and that work meant that she then understood why she was to take her inhaler. She's now binned her reliever inhaler and flown through her second pregnancy. So this stuff saves lives, and it's powerful stuff. The aim of using the community champions is, please remember, people don't come to my clinic as individuals. They are part of a family and a community, and they are people that need speaking to by trusted members of that community. There's loads of misconceptions about asthma care and the treatment, and lots of stigma as well attached to the diagnosis. It makes people less marriageable, less able to work. There's lots of other problems. Just wanted to finish off by highlighting the investment I'm making in graphic medicine. So I'm working with a really talented doctor called Lottie Kaur. If you go to IKEA, you'll get instructions in about 17 different languages and some pictures just like that. And if you're on an aeroplane and you don't speak that language, you get instructions laminated in your seat. Well, we thought we'd do about the same. This is just a little mock-up, something Lottie did for this conference. So a person's leaving their house, breathing in some pollen, gets short of breath, coughing, takes an inhaler, feels better. All of that, there's not a single word on that sheet. So that's the power of graphic medicine. And Lottie's very happy to be contacted if anybody wants to speak to her. The vision is that we continue to make all this information accessible for clinicians and patients um, with asthma. We gain more actionable information to help guide interventions. We maintain our champions at local level that we sustain and, and scale. And then we measure the success. I'd like to finish by just reminding everybody that we need to work together to level distributive injustices and give asthma patients the care that they sorely deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I hope that was a fantastic intro and really brought to the life uh, some of those kind of background context things uh, that I introduced the session with. I'm now going to hand over to Galib, who's going to talk about the work that he's been doing uh, on health inequality as well. Hi, everyone. Probably won't hold it too close or too far. It's fine. Perfect. So my name is Galib. I'm the co-founder of Written Medicine. We provide accessible medication content for patients with communication barriers, language barriers, and other barriers as well. Um, as you can see, we created the solution due to experiencing communication barriers in community pharmacies we worked in in central London. So every third patient that used to come to a pharmacy I worked in had a language barrier. So we were based in central London just off Baker Street and Marble Arch. So we had lots of tourists coming in who forgotten their medication and so forth. And so I thought, why not? connect Google Translate to our PMR system to provide bilingual content. Um, by the way, don't connect Google Translate. It's a horrible solution. But <laughs> so our vision is to provide accessible medication content at the point of prescribing, dispensing, and discharge through the system suppliers. Sounds simple, but trying to get all the system suppliers on to play ball is a very difficult game. Um, and to get commissioners interested or NHS England interested is another different ball game altogether as well. So you may recognize one of the images from the previous presentation. And this is just to show what good looks like outside of healthcare. 
And you know, when we consider eight is the average reading age in the UK, you know, we should be providing this kind of content. Now, I, uh, apart from um, um, suffering from health, sorry, language barriers and communication barriers in pharmacies, I also have a son with Down syndrome, so he's, he's got his own communication barriers. My mum speaks English with a limited ability. My grandmother was deaf and mute. I've got dyslexia and dyspraxia. So all of these communication barriers, healthcare doesn't you know, meet our needs um, a lot of the time. And so this is a wall from my son's school. This is a lady using a ATM machine for a hearing aid. This is a credit card or debit card with um, a arrow indicating which way to insert the chip and pin for someone with visual impairment. And these are just like you know um, gimmicks, but that's HSBC in Chinatown in London, and that's um, a bilingual logo for Southall in West London. So as I was mentioning, eight is the average reading age, and all of these people with these associated um, you know, age-related memory impairment or learning disabilities, limited ability in English, low limited literacy or special needs sensory needs have communication barriers. These lead to miscommunication and medication safety issues. Now, all of these groups are disproportionately affected by long-term conditions, but in healthcare, we, we're not doing anything to combat this. Scale of the problem. So according to the 2011 census and home office, six million people have age-related memory impairment, one and a half million people with learning disabilities, and over four million people speak English poorly, not at all. So there's a financial implication of this as well. So this is a cycle of ill health. Um, someone with language barriers or communication barriers, newly diagnosed with a chronic condition, even if they get a interpreter uh, um, in the GP or secondary care, the likelihood of them recalling that information once they get home is between 40 to 80 percent, right? So, and will they remember that information 100 percent? We're not sure. So, this can lead to patients not taking the medications properly, underdosing, overdosing, revisit to the GP. GP says, Are you taking the medication properly? If it's my mum, she'll just say a white lie, yeah, 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 yeah. So, then that may be the good medication, the correct medication, but all of a sudden the GP may have increased the dose or changed the medication as well. And this leads on. And eventually it's premature death. We know that ethnic minorities and those in deprived areas live 10 to 30 years less. So I live in Northwest London, part of, in an area called St. Johnswood, very famous for Abbey Road and the Beatles. That is one of the most expensive areas. We share the same postcode with the area called Church Street, one of the most deprived areas in the country. And there's 30 years um, um, age um, differentiation between both areas. So our solution is currently available in 15 languages. We're able to print bilingual pharmacy dispensing labels, um, medication summary sheets. We're integrated into a couple of um, medication um, software systems. So this is an e-discharge system at London Northwest Healthcare. Um, There's a system called ePro, but that's now being replaced with um, Cerna. So we're in the process of doing that piece of work. So this is our academic results with 156 patients in 12 community pharmacies. And as you can see yourself, you know, um, before being given our intervention, 58% of the patients were confident. These are long-term medications. They were happy with you know, taking the medication. Yeah, I don't need any help. Once they were given a bilingual label, they realized actually the medication may have changed in primary care after coming back home from the hospital, or they may have not read the BNF warning correctly patient engagement, so 98% of the patients were able to read the translated content. Um, so you've got medication adherence, where 80% of the patients said it helped them take the medication. Increased patient independence, so before 23% of the patients were independent, we increased that to 75%. Patient experience, 80% wanted this as a regular service. 66% thought it influenced their choice of pharmacy as well. So this is a user case. So um, London Northwest Healthcare is one of the first um, organizations to use our software. Incredibly diverse um, area, spend a million pounds on interpreting every year. 10% of one of their boroughs don't speak English, right? So you can see how much of an impact our software can make in that particular area. Considering these populations are six times more likely to be predisposed to genetic um, um, conditions such as diabetes or cardio, um, cardiovascular diseases, um, socioeconomic disadvantages, lower income households, overcrowded multiple occupancy homes. And that's it. So thank you very much.
Thanks very much, Galib. I think that's two fantastic examples that just really demonstrate that if we don't develop interventions targeted at accessing specific patient populations, developing interventions that meet their needs, we're missing out on a massive chunk of society. That's always going to mean that that chunk of society will always suffer from health inequalities. We'll always have those poorer health and well-being outcomes, the poorer life outcomes, and so on, um, which really kind of brings to life some of those earlier examples and the graphics that I presented. Um, I'm going to hand over to Laura now for another fantastic example of some of the work we've been doing around health inequalities. Thank you. Hi, so my name's Laura Boyd. I work at UCL Partners and I'm um, Deputy Director of our Cardiovascular Disease Programme. And you might be thinking, why is she talking about CVD as this is an asthma um, uh, session? Well, uh, the fact is we were working on a CVD programme and then COVID hit. And overnight it became apparent that it might be quite challenging to engage primary care, which is what we would planned to do around um, blood tech, uh, high blood pressure and so on. So we rapidly changed tact. Um, and at UCLP, uh, we work with Matt Kearney, who's a GP who, who you might who might know of. And overnight, I think it was the first day of lockdown, he said, um, I know from previous pandemics, uh, people more people will die from their conditions not being properly managed than from the, than from the pandemic itself. Um, and that's because routine care is interrupted. People don't go to their routine annual appointments with their GP. They'll stop seeking out their care and will stop proactively reaching out to them. And as a GP, he said, well, we need to do something to support primary care, ensure that people don't miss out on that everyday care that keeps them well and prevent some of those inequalities being exacerbated. So we pulled together um, a small team of clinicians um, at UCL Partners and Deep Shot as a GP sitting in the second row is one of them. And we came together to think about how could we develop a kind of framework that might be able to help. But we had some underlying principles because we knew everyone, um, and they remain today, still under enormous pressure. So one of our principles was we couldn't add to the primary care workload. We couldn't add more pressure to GPs. We had to ensure this was led um, by public um, and had great patient involvement so that really meeting um, the stated needs um, that patients were telling us were important to them. We had to ensure that we were following nice guidelines, so best practice, so primary care would say to us, yes, we absolutely get on board with this. Um, and we needed something to help pa patients stay well, ideally at home, because we were uh, managing um, a global pandemic. So what came out were, were our proactive care frameworks. Um, and you can see them on the UCL Partners website, and they've been taken up um, nationally, and I'll come on to that shortly. We started with two, condition, two conditions, asthma and COPD, because of our understanding of COVID at that time. But essentially, what the frameworks do is they search and stratify patients with these conditions on the GP record, so whether that's system one or EMIS, depending on whatever the primary care system uses. And they pull them out into a number of risk buckets, depending on how well managed those patients are, according to how they've been coded on that um, primary care record. They then suggest a series of interventions or pathways um, that are suitable um, for those risk buckets. But at the heart of the innovation um, is a sense of how can we use that wider primary care workforce to help manage for those patients. So for those who are well managed, how, what role could healthcare assistants or other suitably trained staff um, within primary care um, do to help manage that, that patient? And that could be anything from demonstrating correct inhaler technique to helping a patient think, well, what happens when I'm out and about and there's a pollen, um, a, a, a pollen attack um, during kind of hay fever, fever season? But there's obviously still a role for that prescribing clinician, that GP, practice nurse, um, whoever. So the frameworks absolutely clearly set out um, suggested interventions um, with the, the clinician at the heart of it. But what's different here is about how do we use that wider workforce to de deliver some of the behavioral change um, interventions and some of those other um, self-supported management in in interventions that help people stay well at home. And how do we use the breadth of workforce to do that? So I'm not going to go into details about the risk uh, buckets and how we've um, pulled people into the different groupings, but Deep, I'm sure, will be happy um, to talk through the details of that at the end, and you can see it on our, on our, um, our website. Um, before I come on to an example of how it's been delivered in practice, I just wanted to talk about the spread. So um, I think we're all pleasantly surprised by the overwhelming support we had from GPs right from the start um, of COVID as to the frameworks. And since then, we've had more than 8,000 downloads of the search and stratification tools. And RCGP guidance that was released two weeks ago has highlighted the frameworks um, as a way to help manage the backlog um, of patients um, living with long-term conditions. 
But what I thought might be useful um, is to give um, a kind of insight as to how um, the asthma framework has been adopted into practice. Um, and this is an example from Knowlesley. So if you do want to find out more after I've spoken, the innovation agency who've been supporting this work have a stand just behind. So please do um, go and grab them. Um, and I'm sure people are familiar with Knowlesley. It's a, the second most deprived um, borough in England. While it's got low um, asthma prevalence, um, it's got above average um, asthma mortality huge inequalities and they're only getting worse with an aging population but there's also a, a high um, prevalence uh, of uh, um, inhaler prescribed prescriptions that go out so above the national average now um, uh, uh, the innovation agency um, in supporting Knowlesley um, saw the frameworks um, and were really keen to think about how could they adapt them um, to reflect lo their local context. So there was already work underway to um, manage some of the higher risk asthma patients in Knowsley, um, but they integrated um, the frameworks um, to identify those high risks which matched um, uh, the, the clinics um, that they already had underway. They thought about what nursing staff were available, what staff were available to help um, manage those patients, and they increased um, the contact time. So nurses then saw the higher risk patients for up to 40 minutes to do a really detailed review and to talk to them about um, kind of the wider lifestyle uh, changes. What I'm trying to say is the frameworks um, were developed um, not as a blueprint, but really as something to be uh, adapted locally to fit local context, to meet uh, local inequalities, to ensure that those at highest risk um, are supported adequately. Um, and just some of the, um, the kind of impact that they've had locally. So um, at the start, they run the search and stratification tools and they pull patients out into those risk buckets. When they repeated um, the search and stratification tools um, three to four more months later, they found that 50% of um, individuals had moved out of that high risk um, group into a lower risk category, um, kind of demonstrating the success um, of, the, of the program. Um, and they also saw a huge um, reduction in the number of inhalers prescribed. So this program, um, has been rolled out um, further. So they secured funding from NHS England as part of a national NHS at home pilot. And they're now looking to see how they can use um, physician associates to help with that wider management um, of those patients. And this is just a piece of feedback that they um, received. Um, demonstrating the kind of the appreciation of, of the time taken um, with a healthcare professional to talk about that kind of wider health needs.